This program is brought to you by Emory University. Please um, allow me to introduce our speakers. I'm going to start first actually with Ashley Wilcott, who will be our moderator this afternoon. Ashley is our newest public servant in the child welfare arena. Yay, a little bit of a round of, of silent applause there, Ashley. I don't know if you saw it. Um, Ashley has been recently appointed to serve as our <coughs> state's child advocate. So she's now the executive director of the Office of the Child Advocate. We're so pleased to have her in that position. Um, her full bio, as well as that of our panel of judges, is on the back of your agenda for today. And so I'll leave that to you to read. But I would just note that um, Ashley has had already quite an outstanding career in child in the child welfare legal sector, serving in a number of positions, including, including as a pro tem judge and as a SAG for a number of years. So she has this great sort of diversity and broad range of experiences and perspectives from which she can draw upon to do the kind of system improvement work that that office calls for. And we're so glad. I appreciate having you here as well as our moderator today. Um, and then to my immediate left is Judge Lane Bearden. He is the president-elect of the Council of Juvenile Court Judges here in Georgia. Um, most importantly, on a daily basis, he is the judge of the Gordon, um, Juvenile Court of Gordon County, where he's been since 1990. Um, and we're so pleased to have him. Next to him, to the left, is uh, Judge Bradley Boyd, who is the presiding judge of Fulton County Juvenile Courts. Um, he has served in a number of different positions as well, all throughout the courts and, and working with juveniles in a direct service capacity and administrative capacity. And then far, to also to the, my far left, to Judge Boyd's immediate left, is Judge uh, Bernie Butler, who's with the Clayton County Juvenile Court, where she's been since 2009. Uh, and again, ex extensive and impressive biographies on all of them that I will commend to you and ask you to look through, but I won't, I'll spare you the time of me reading them to you. Um, we tried here to have a diversity, both geographically, um, in terms of the range of courts and experience-wise, <coughs> to bring a range of perspectives from the bench about this topic of open courts. And so with that, I'm gonna invite Ashley up to kick this off. Thank you, Martha. Thank you all. And I'm gonna thank the judges for taking your time and being here because you obviously are the ones who implement this and know this law well. And I'd like to start um, as the moderator with a, with a quote, and I believe this is from Judge Bearden's information that's a handout that you all should have all received. And that mm -hmm. states, absent specific legal authority, public access to court proceedings should be unfettered and unobstructed, and Georgia's courtroom shall be open to the public unless otherwise provided by law. Now this is a piece, an opinion from the Georgia's Judicial Qualifications Commission. So my question for each of the three of you is, does this <coughs> apply to juvenile courts? And if not, why not? And I'm gonna start with my far left, Judge Butler, if you would like to respond first. It absolutely does apply to juvenile courts and um, uh, juvenile courts, like any other court, um, are public forums. Um, there are certain instances and certain matters which um, are closed uh, based on subject matter um, or the information presented therein, but for the most part, juvenile courts, like any other court, should not go unchecked. Um, there are um, benefits and detriments, I think, in juvenile as well as superior court to um, having people there, but there are also in place um, um, constraints or uh, remedies if a problem does arise. So that individual people can be removed or at certain um, times any uninvolved or unrelated person can be removed. So I think it applies. Judge Well, uh, the assumption is of an open court. And I think that assumption applies to all courts, including juvenile court. Um, there are probably some unique kind of situations that arise in juvenile court which do allow for uh, some consideration of what kind of restrictions might be important to put into place in the courtroom. Um, there are some very sensitive matters that deal with um, families and children, and um, but the law provides for the consideration of that. So in, as, as far as what the statement from the JQC is, that yes, the assumption applies to all courts, including juvenile courts, and. You know, I'm quite satisfied that the procedures that are in place for um, making those exceptions where it's not or, or, or placing certain restrictions on access are sufficient to allow us to, to protect what needs to be protected. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I would say yes, but um, I, I know that JQC opinion. Uh, I, uh, Lester Tate 
who is an attorney, uh, the, the past president of the state bar, who is on the JQC now, uh, is, is a friend. And we've spoken about this opinion extensively. It really had nothing to do with the juvenile courts, although the philosophy is the same. What was going on, and, and, and maybe we'll go into this in a little bit more detail, is th there are some times when the courts intentionally try and close their doors to everyone and don't want anyone to know. That was really the purpose of the 207 legislation. Well, I know we'll talk about that. Uh, and then there are times that just because of security or practice or, 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 or lack of caring, uh, the, the doors to the courtrooms were closed, locked. And then uh, when they were opened, the, uh, certain people were invited in. And if you weren't part of the people that were involved in that case, you were not invited in. And so what was going on in certain courts, not the juvenile courts, but um, and maybe in some juvenile courts, but, but that was the, the purpose of this JQC opinion is uh, people were being told, no, you can't come in. Uh, if you're not involved in this case, for security purposes, we won't let you come in. You can stay in the lobby. Uh, and um, the Supreme Court didn't like that, and JQC certainly didn't like it, and said very clearly, no, these, these should be open forums. These are, this is government in the sunshine in practice. This is, this is the way you check what the courts do. And if the courts are glad and happy to be doing what they're doing and think that they're proud of their actions and, and are doing a good thing, they should be open to the public. They should be open to public criticism or viewing or support. Um, how do we effectively transmit messages unless we are public? So, so yes, the JQC theory that these should be open certainly applies, and, and that was the goal behind 207, but uh, um, they weren't talking about us. That was, that's pretty strong language in the JQC. It's, it's as close as JQC comes to scolding a whole class of courts uh, as you're ever going to get. Uh, I don't think it was us, but it, it could have been. And could I just ask you to expand on that? You, say you refer to the Senate Bill 207. Can you just tell everyone what that refers to and when it passed and what specifically it provided for? Sure. Um, I was on the legislative committee of the Council of Juvenile Court Judges uh, back when the proposal first came about to open the courtrooms. Well, I mean, it's been discussed. I've been doing this 24 years. It's, it's been doing, uh, we've been doing it a long time. Uh, but when it first came up as legislation, uh, I did come to some of the committee meetings. I did go to some of the hearings. Um, judges are in a kind of an awkward position, and I, I don't know, uh, th there are arguments pro and con about this. I, I'm old school. I take the position that judges really shouldn't enter into legislation. You know, that we are, we are uh, the judges, and if the legislature decides to do something, so be it. We will attempt to apply the law to it, uh, be fair, neutral. Um, but I'm not sure that unless it just particularly uh, affects, um, you know, the, the way I am supposed to practice, uh, that, that we really shouldn't enter into it. Just whatever the legislature says is fine. So, so we went to the legislature not with an agenda. There were people who had an agenda. And there were some really strong opinions on both sides, and I think they were well taken on both sides. Um, the primary theory I heard behind 207, and this was really, I guess, in the fall of 2009, became effective in 2010, was the argument was that the Department of Family and Children's Services was hiding behind the closed courts and, and not being seen. You know, bad cases were happening, bad decisions were being made, the judges had to rule, um, has the department made reasonable efforts, have they not, and no one was knowing about these because these were closed proceedings. Um, the judge's primary concern, and some of the opponent's concern was, well, the way this evolved from the late 1800s when you know juvenile court began as animal protection legislation, and only then did they decide that that might also apply to kids, and then when it evolved into a code in the 1930s, and then it, as it evolved later, the idea was we, we didn't want kids or parents or other folks to be known in the community. We didn't want these cases to be public so everyone would know about that. And that's the way it kind of evolved. And so by the time the hearings boiled around, one position was everyone needs to know what's going on to keep the department and the courts honest. And the other position was you're, you're really harming kids in some instances or you're, you're harming the parents. Uh, that you're, you're making it public now. The crowds will start coming in. Everyone will know that the, this parent is doing this or doing that. And, and whether that's actually done that or hasn't done that or affected it in any way, I think is open for debate. But, but that, was the, that was the debate in 207. 
Um, I will say that once it was passed, there was a, a, not a great sigh of relief. There just wasn't much. It was just deafening silence. I mean, the, the judges said, well, well, we'll do some things. I gave some samples of some orders that, that I had <coughs> drafted to start opening legislation. You could either close court for everyone except just the essential parties or close it to one or two individuals. Um, and um, uh, it, it just wasn't, wasn't happening very much. People weren't, weren't turning to this as some great new change. And uh, uh, you know, other than just saying everyone come in and then telling people these are public courts, now you're welcome to stay. We didn't do much differently. I didn't post any notices or <coughs> start inviting the media or putting it in the newspaper. But I do say, and I, I continue to say when people come together, um, these are open proceedings. And, and unless they've been closed by specific order, you're welcome to be here. And in fact, I tell people, you know, you might learn some things from listening to the other cases. And uh, uh, when we get to reunite a child with the parents and the government gets out of your hair, uh, and uh, there's no more court involvement, that's a great thing and everyone's happy about it. Or if we have to terminate and a child finds a permanent place with a, with a loving home, then, then that's a great feeling and you might want to see that too. And there's everything in between. So if you want to stay and learn, you can. If you want to go out in the lobby, go out in the lobby, we'll call the cases there. And uh, a lot of people stay and I think it's very educational. So anyway, that, that's the whole history of it from my little perspective. Uh, it came about and then maybe it's We've adapted to it, maybe not. And it was effective January 1st, 2010, is yes. that correct? So we're entering year four, right, of the open courts. Judge Boyd, let me ask directly about the dependency proceedings. Um, when did you learn as a judge that this law had passed and that it applied? You now had to have public courtrooms unless there was an exception met, et cetera. Well, I learned about it very shortly after it passed. And I sort of sat there waiting to see what would happen and as Judge Lane said, not much happened. Uh, we have, in the, in, since it's passed, I don't recall any uh, hearing where we specifically litigated that issue. Now, we, I, I did have one situation where um, the cameras from one of the TV stations showed up the morning of a preliminary hearing that's sort of a different kind of issue that requires some sort of advance notice on their part that they want admission. And at that point, I said, I can't let you in here. If there are succeeding hearings, then you can file the appropriate motions and we will consider them and you can possibly be back for it. We never heard from them again. Uh, you know, something else replaced the news cycle. Um, and other than that, I think what happens in our courtroom is, is kind of an informal sort of thing. Folks will come in, and for the most part, um, cases come in one at a time, and the parties who are there bring in the folks that, that they want in there, and, and then those who are witnesses will be excluded. Those who are not can stay and observe the proceedings. Um, once in a while, um, there'll be some question by one of the other parties as to whether these folks that are in the courtroom ought to be there. And usually that's sort of resolved by the attorneys. Uh, there'll have to be some disagreement um, or, or to come to some agreement really because I think both sides or all sides sort of understand that the, those situations sort of cut in all directions. And if someone says, well, there's been a lot of, you know, we got a, we've got an aunt or a grandmother here who's just waiting to sort of pounce on mama about something, um, and she's really not going to be a witness, um, usually the discussion with the attorneys will resolve that. And it, it's not, it doesn't get to me as something that needs to be litigated in the hearing with an order. Um, since the courts have been open, we just, we haven't seen the, um, any, any kind of um, motions to, to come in. And I think, particularly in, in the Atlanta area, um, there is so much stuff that hits the media and the news every day that um, if something rises to the top, it's got to be replaced the next day unless it's something incredibly egregious. And it just gets lost in the news cycle and, and public awareness uh, of what's going on in that particular case doesn't really materialize. Okay. So 
So if this effective <coughs> January 2010 code allows for a public courtroom unless there's an exception that's been motioned and, and you decide, okay, it's closed to those people, why can the media not come in as part of the public and video or record everything that's going on in that case? Well, I think they can. Uh, the, the procedures that are set out for that does require that they give advance notice so that folks can prepare to be heard on it. Uh, I, and my, if they do that, then there is sort of an assumption from the cases that have come so far that they ought to be able to cover it just as part of the public and, and public information. But uh, what they can't do is show up just as, a hear as the hearing's coming into court and say, I want to. We want to tape it. All right. So there is a separate process that they do need to follow if media wants to come in versus the public. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. And many. Judge mm -hmm. Butler, I'd like to turn to you. And to me, it really is the crux of, of the matter in terms of two different sides believing you should or should not have an open juvenile court. And that is, what about the identity of the child? And what so, does it do to that having open courtrooms? Um, okay. First, I want to go back to what Judge Boyd was saying. I believe it's two days notice. I was trying to find it in my notes, but I don't have my glasses on, so I can't see much of this. But I think it's two days advance notice that the media has to give. Okay. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. two Thank days. Um, and then the court can evaluate it and have a hearing if necessary. Um, with respect to the identity of the child, um, if it's the media, um, the statute also provides that the media cannot identify the child, the child's family, foster parents, um, caretakers, I think, residents, addresses, a lot of information that the media cannot release. And so in those instances, the uh, anonymity of the child remains. Um, you see the proceedings and you may know um, what occurred, but you don't necessarily know the parties involved. And so. Um, that is not a detriment to the child, the family rehabilitation or reunification or any of that. Um, with respect to the public, um, first, it's been my experience that there has not been um, any great public interest in the cases. In general, just as before SB um, 207, it's the parties and their family and friends who come, and those people already know what's going on, and that's why they're there. Um, and that has, and then there may, you know, you may have CASA volunteers, you may have volunteers in training, um, we have CASA staff at our core, so you'll have those people, you know, um, but in my experience, the presence of the people who do come has been more beneficial um, than detrimental because oftentimes, even though people may know that the uh, family is involved in court, they may not know exactly what is going on with court. And when they come and they're able to get an accurate depiction of what's going on, you see stronger support systems many times around the family and the child. And, and in instances when um, uh, the parents do work their plan, you see that family or friend support system helping them and moving them through the process. And when they do not, you see that same support system stepping up and being a resource for the child in many ways. Um, so in my experience, it's been a very positive thing. And there just has not been, I haven't um, had any instances at all um, of people wanting to come in who really were unrelated to the case. Uh, unless there's a, like Judge Boyd said, uh, you know, a huge media instance for 15 seconds or so, and the people come in in that 15 seconds, they may want to come in for a moment, but they're they're over it before we ever get to adjudication nine times out of 10. Um, and I think since I've been on the bench, I know it hasn't been that long, all, all five of those years, I'm, I've had one. So um, I just haven't experienced the flood. Let me play devil's advocate with you. So you're in, in Clayton County and there's an egregious <coughs> horrific case that comes before you that's a dependency case. Public is welcome. You have no motion before you saying we'd like to close this courtroom either to everyone or some people. And their public members say that a community organization chooses to come to listen to this particular case, which you may not have seen yet. But worst case, what if that happens and they decide to walk outside and call Channel 2 and say, let me tell you about this child named Jane Doe. Is there anything in place to protect the identi identity of that child when it comes to the public disclosing it? Yeah, SB 207 carried all of that, um, con they considered all of that, and it also, uh, makes it a, let's see, I believe a misdemeanor. I really, I will bring my glasses next time, I promise. Uh, but any information that the media would be 
um, excluded from disseminating, so is any other person excluded from disseminating that information. And okay. so the statute took that into consideration. Okay. So let me, let me yes, jump in on do. this because <clears throat> we had just, a, just, a, just an awful, terrible, uh, internationally worthy, newsworthy case with a family of five being killed by a gentleman and the baby was hung. Just, 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 just most egregious circumstances possible in Gordon County a few years ago. Um, and we had international news media coming in. We had all the satellite trucks. And in, in Calhoun, we don't see that very much. Uh, in in uh, Judge Boyd's court, and that, that's an everyday <laughs> occurrence. But in, uh, in Gordon County, we don't see that well. Um, the, the, the news media really was governed uh, at that point uh, essentially by the Florida versus uh, Atlantic um, uh, decision. And uh, the court did have to have a hearing. There, there were not presumptions of it being open to the public. Uh, they were very agreeable, and uh, uh, we had a, a solitary news feed, so there's just one camera, even though there were 50 groups sharing that, that feed. We had a specific order. Now, 207 was not in effect then, and, and I have not seen any decision that says, let's look at what used to be the law, Florida Atlantic Supreme Court rulings on the publicity, and now the even broader standards of 207, or under the new code, uh, uh, 1511 700. So, so we may not have had an opinion yet as to does that mean that it, it can be limited in some uh, parts by the court or is it completely open if the news media is involved? In our case, we allowed them to be present. They did not uh, show the, um, the mother um, and they had agreed to blur out certain faces of, uh, of people in that case. And there, there was a motion to close by the guardian, the attorney guardian in that case. And so they were the one arguing for some closure. Uh, but we allowed most of the rest of the courtroom to be shown by the news feed. Um, and, uh, and, and I think um, they did move on uh, fairly quickly. But it was, it, was, uh, it was a tough time for everybody to be sure we were trying to, to not step on people's rights. I, I just don't know that 207 and the general federal law have come together yet. It'll be interesting to see what happens, when, probably in, in Fulton, uh, when, that, uh, when that ruling comes down. <laughs> You're welcome, Judge Boyd, when it comes <laughs> to you. So I'm going to do this a little different, Melissa. I'm going to change it up a little bit because these judges have such a wealth of information, and I'm not going to hit on all of it, unfortunately. I, so I do want to open it up for questions, just about any of the comments they've made so you can remember who said it if you want to direct it to them. And I'm going to move on if you don't have questions at this time, but let's give you a chance to ask any of those. They've told you a lot of great information. Yes, ma'am. And, and if you would, just speak up so we can hear you. Pardon? If you could speak up so we can hear you. Okay. My name is Carla Friend, and my question uh, actually goes to what um, Judge Bearden said in terms of uh, in your courtroom, there is, or in the courthouse, there's notices posted letting the public know that they have access, you know, to all the courtrooms. And I was wondering if, among the other judges, if you feel that that is a good way, because when you talk about um, public knowledge of this, the media always knows what's going on in terms of, you know, the newest laws and newest access regarding, you know, any kind of proceeding. But the ordinary person who's coming to juvenile court doesn't know that. So is that something that you would recommend that because this law is in effect, that within every courthouse area, there's there's notice posted saying that, you know, you are allowed, you know, to access every courtroom and also to um, spell out the restrictions on that access, such as the ones that you were mentioning that are on the, the media. Because you're saying, what you're saying is that you're not seeing a lot of you know, an upchuck, you know, in the public coming to these meetings. And it may be because the general public is not really aware of it. And I ask this because I know in Superior Court, there are just some people who routinely, you know, go to trials and for various reasons. And so I was wondering if you think that that is a, a good way to inform the general public. Because I think that what Judge Bearden said was that you find that people who come is beneficial to them because they can learn from what's going on in other cases. And that sometimes makes them better prepared <coughs> when it's time for their case. And so is there a way that we can kind of like actively promote, you know, more public involvement, you know, in cases that are not related to them? 
And let me just repeat it so I make sure that those who are listening online will have the question and information. And I'm just going to summarize to say your question back to the panel is, should courts um, advertise, is not the best word, but for lack of a better description, advertise that these are public courts open to the public and inform the public via signage, for instance? Uh, let, let me clarify one thing, Ms. Fran, and that is I do have opening comments to, to the, uh, everybody that comes into court. We open the doors and say, everybody step in. Uh, uh, we don't have signs posted saying that. We do have a sign posted that says, don't videotape. And uh, you know, everyone's friend is the cell phone camera now. And uh, uh, some people will use those or bits and pieces of those. Uh, and you know, surprisingly, there's not a Supreme Court rule that's been agreed upon on the use of those. Uh, some people say, well, that's media. It, it shouldn't be allowed. Some people say, well, you should allow it, but it's got to be in context or the entire thing uh, used. But uh, you know, the one sign we have outside the courthouse is you're not allowed to videotape without spe specific permission of the court. I do make comments to the public that says, you're welcome to be here, uh, and I'm not going to ask who you are or what you're interested in. Um, you know, I keep expecting people who are just bored to step in, but I don't see that very much. Sometimes our air conditioning is a little bit better in the summer than other places, so <laughs> we do have some people. I wonder if that's why they're there. But, uh, 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 but, but the other question is, should we invite people? I think people should know that they're open, if that's what the, the, the purpose of the legislation is, uh, is to, to open the court. I, I, you know, people ask all the time, can, can we come? And I say, sure, please, stay. I look at it from a, a very practical um, perspective. We have, uh, as Ms. Friend knows, an incredibly busy and packed schedule in Fulton County courts every day. And um, I would s expect that if we took some initiative to sort of bring folks into the courtroom who wouldn't otherwise consider wanting to be there or, or coming in, undoubtedly that will probably generate some more hearings that will need to address that issue. Um, and just as a matter of, of trying to take good care of the time we have to address the cases we have, I wouldn't take any action that would probably put more demands on court hearings. So is it fair to say due to your case volume and the amount of, of cases coming in that it may not be practical? Is that a fair well, summary? Well, uh, uh, I mean, if they come and, and, and want, want to be in there and there is some objection to it, then of course we'll address it. But it seems to me to sort of solicit folks or to invite folks in who might not otherwise think of coming, will, it's inevitable that will generate some more court time to address whether they should be there and folks uh, probably in Ms. Friend's office who will say, no, I don't want them in here while, they're, while my client is, is, is exposed. Um, so I, I just, I, I, uh, I don't see it's necessarily the role of the court to try to, to promote that. We'll, we'll enforce it and we'll, we'll uh, abide by the law and we'll, we'll do what we need to do, but um, I, for very practical reasons, I probably would not choose to do that. All right, Judge Butler. Um, I don't think it's a bad idea. I think it's it's a it's a great idea, but I agree with Judge Boyd. I think it's outside of the scope of what we do to go out and promote um, and ask people to come in to these cha cases. I think that if the public is interested in a case, I think they should come. Um, in Clayton County, I know we do a lot of community work. We have a lot of community partners. Um, we have a lot of uh, programs in the community and. Um, and oftentimes those people may drop by the court and you may see one additional or you may see a pastor or, you know, from one of the churches that we work with and they may come sit in the back of the court. But in terms of the flood, in, in, in terms of just the doors of the courthouse being beaten down to get into that, that I have not seen. Um, and although I'm not against promoting, I just don't think that that is, um, I, think, I don't think that that's inside the scope of what I should do. Along those same lines, I think all three of you have referenced that you may have different systems in your counties for what I would term calendar call or calling your cases. Judge Boyd, you indicated that you call one case in at a time. Judge Bearden, I believe in your court you may have a calendar call where all cases come in at once. So my question for the panel is, does the code say 
all cases need to be called in at once so the public ha those people are public and can come in or is that the discretion of the court how do you deal with that in terms of calling cases in if that makes sense uh, i don't think the code talks about that okay. uh, it's, it's just silent as to that we we actually try and break it down into uh, if we know there's a termination we'll try and do one maybe two cases in a, in a morning um, terminations can last two or three days in my court and, and I think often do in other cases. Um, uh, we, we will try and do five or six cases at the hour and a half. Uh, so if there are judicial reviews, for example, we'll set four or five at nine o'clock. We'll set another four or five at 1030. Now, we may be going till seven o'clock at night. So it may be an extremely optimistic perspective that we'll do five cases an hour and a half. But, but we do that, and I have those comments to the public and I bring everyone in, or I open the doors at least and say, all right, now we're gonna do the 1030 calendar call, by the way, you know, you're welcome to be here if you'd like to, if you'd like, because people just don't know, I don't think. I don't, I don't think that they, they have any idea whether they're supposed to be there or not be there. Uh, and some people, um, like I said, are, are, are merely curious. Now, there is a different situation, and I think as, as OCA, you can see this. When, when you have one of those where, say, a boyfriend is accused of, of, of seriously injuring a child, and that family kind of moves in as a unit, maybe they're all wearing all the same button or the same suit or something in solidarity for the accused boyfriend who's not a party to the case, and they all sit together and they all stare together and they all do this, that, and the other, that's a little unnerving. Uh, the judge has some things they can do other than close the courtroom because, you know, that's, that's the idea is it's supposed to be open. But there are some things you can do to protect a child. Um, there are some things you can do to uh, uh, make sure that uh, uh, it's not seen as an attempt to impose some undue influence on the court in some group. So, so that would never be appropriate. But, uh, uh, and, and I've seen the way Fulton operates, and I... I, I amazed by that. I applaud that. I think that they, it's shocking to me the number of cases they get in and out in an efficient way. Uh, we just, uh, we have uh, court uh, two days a week in Gordon and about 1,200 cases a year. So compared to that, we just, uh, and, and about 40% of those are dependency deprived. So we're, we're just not dealing with the numbers that they are. So you all would agree that the legislation doesn't require you to do it in a certain way. You can run your courtroom as you deem fit, understanding the public can come in. Is that fair? And Judge Boyd, I'm going to turn it over to you, and then Judge Bell. Yeah, uh, we have, we begin, and I think all the judges in our courts begin the, the morning and, and afternoon, if there's a calendar on both, with a calendar call. And that's just the attorneys sort of reporting on status of cases and maybe a probation officer or other interested parties who can give information, but in terms of calling, and then we sort of see what's ready and what isn't. We call them in as they're ready, and um, if we've got uh, interpreters or psychologists or someone who's on the clock, we'll try and move those cases through first. Um, so we, we use a calendar call just to try to organize our, our efforts and, and, um, and our time. Um, but uh, I suppose we only will recognize that there may be some folks beyond the parties or whomever that are interested in being there if and when the case actually comes in, unless someone says, we've got a whole bunch of folks out there and um, they all seem to have some interest or sometimes they raise it as a security concern, sometimes more on delinquency cases than on deprivation cases. and. They let us know simply because we need to put some, some security folks in place. Judge Felton. Um, in Clayton County, <clears throat> excuse me, um, the three judges do it differently. For me, I do time certain calendaring if it's an adjudication, a review hearing, um, a TPR, um, non reunification, those are time certain, so it's the only thing scheduled at that time for me. Um, so there's generally not anyone there. If it's an arraignment calendar, um, or a disposition calendar, I'll do a calendar call, but in the courtroom there are just the attorneys and me. Um, and like Judge Boyd said, it's just for what, what are you ready on, what can we get moving on, how can we um, keep these parents from sitting in the hall so long, because, you know, parents have other things to do. And, uh, and, it's, and we call them in as they're ready um, according to their attorneys. And so there really is just one case in at a time, although no one is, you know, stopped from coming in. And we go call the name of the case we're doing. Those people come in and no one else does. And, of course, that could be because they don't know that they can. Um, have a question? 
I didn't want to interrupt I just as you're finishing my question then is if I know there's a case in your courtroom and y'all may not know this is you know maybe more about your clerk but I'm curious if you know you know so I know that there's a case in your courtroom or at least in that court and I need to find out when it's scheduled so that I can show up is your clerk going to give me that information um, or can and, they? I think and, it's another and part. can they, yeah. Does the, does the statute address that? And what do local procedures say about that? And I'll repeat, are these questions loud enough, Corky, or do yes, you need me? They're good. Go ahead. <coughs> okay. No, that's, I mean, the summary is, um, can someone call the court and find out when a case is scheduled? Right? Uh, I'll start. Uh, yes, and all we'll tell them is the time that it's set for. But the, I did notice it's important, and not, not a better way of doing it, but a very different way of doing it. I have the public in for the calendar call. I want them to hear, you know, what, what is the status of the cases? What are the attorneys saying? If they're continuances, why are they continuances? Are they good continuances? So I, I think the calendar call is just as public as every other proceeding. Now, that, that might be a disaster in the busy courts, you know, it, it just might be. But also the difference is, since we don't have a, a rolling calendar, I'll also have six or seven cases at one time, and I have all the attorneys giving the announcements. I'll say everyone in the A case, and I'll say, we're not gonna do this alphabetically, but I'm gonna call it alphabetically first, and then we'll call it in the order that, that will be most efficient, and we'll get the most people out of court as quickly as, as I can. But having said that, with the attorneys please answer in these cases, what's the status of it? Is it an agreement? Are we, you know, is, is this contested hearing going to take four hours? Uh, uh, do we have witnesses on call here? What's going to go on? But uh, the public's there in, in my court for the calendar call, too. It's not better. It's just a different way of doing it. And do, do you receive any calls from the public saying, what time is this hearing? And if you did or have, would you tell them your yeah, court? Yes and yes. Okay. And Judge Boyd and Judge Butler, have you gotten those calls? And would you tell them if you have? In Clayton County, they would call the clerk's office. So, and yes, they can tell them. But I don't know if they, you know, how many they get or if they've gotten any. But you would call the clerk's office and they would answer that question. I think the same thing would happen in Fulton. You'd call the clerk's office. I think our clerk is probably up to speed on um, what the law is and would probably give out that information if it ever comes to my, if I get a call saying, can I do this? My answer is yes. Tell them. So let's say this. That's the, let's go to the next logical step or question in my mind. And that is, you receive a call, the clerk's office says, yes, that case is specifically scheduled special set for 10 a.m. this morning. And so the next question is, well, great, I can't come. I would just like a copy of the record so I know what's going on. And I'm going to start, Judge Boyd, because of your expression with you. What's the response and what does the law provide for in terms of providing the public with the record? No, we're not going to do that. <laughs> and are you required to by law? Does it say in this statute well, I, you when, have to give the record? When you say the record, I mean, we can... Um, I think we can provide uh, what the schedule, what the, the calendar is, and when the cases are set, and okay. so on. But in terms of all the pleadings, no. Um, I I wouldn't. Um, and I would argue that the law is, is not written to say that you should or need to. I, I, I disagree. Okay, good. I, I think good. fifteen. See, yeah, finally, I got some got <laughs> disagreement here. This is good. This I is disagree a little bit. Fifteen eleven forty says. Any complaint, petition, or order from any case that was open to the public may be inspected by the general public. Now, the question has been to me, can we make photocopies? And my answer is no. But if they choose to come in and look at that, you can specify it's a, it's a, a copy of my order, it's a copy of the petition, or a copy of the complaint. Yes, they can come in and see that. Right? Now, that would be overwhelming in Fulton. I cannot imagine trying to do that or even finding that or having to, to add the additional staff members to do that. But, but we've had it from time to time and I say, yeah, these, the, the statute says I have to open it up to these. And if, I, if this hearing was not closed beforehand, I'm, I'm not gonna consider closing it now. If it was open before, it's, they get to look at the complaint petition in my order. Now well, does I, I the media also get to or is that a different exception for media? I don't well, know. We hadn't come to that yet. Okay, so, good, you haven't encountered Florida yet. versus Atlantic would say, um, uh, no, uh, the new code section might suggest that it does. Mm -hmm. Judge Boyd? No, I, I would agree with that. I mean, that, that it's open for inspection. I think the question was, can I get a copy? Oh, right. oh, okay. That's, right. that's different. That's, then you cannot get a copy. Judge Butler? 
And that's Anything? right. The code section is 701. The current code section is 701. That would allow them to get a copy of the petition and complaint. They can get um, traffic cases and I think it's legitimation cases. Um, and then any other hearing that was open to the public, they can look. Okay. But they cannot copy or they have cannot a copy. copy. All right, Judge Butler, I'd like to start. I'm going to move on again to a little bit of a different area, and that is what are the reasons under the law that you can hear a motion and choose to exclude either certain party, uh, certain public <coughs> people, or all public from a hearing? Um, well, the code, uh, the code and SB 207 <coughs> provides that anytime there's an, um, there will be allegations of sexual abuse. Um, a delinquent matter where there are significant um, discussions of dependency um, and then for the best interest of the child that the hearing can be closed on the motion of the attorney, any party guardian ad litem for the child or the court on its own motion. Um, so um, also anytime I think that there may be sensitive medical um, information where that may be otherwise protected, say under HIPAA, um, when those type matters are being um, discussed, then that part of the hearing can be closed uh, because those privacy interests remain. So, Should a court, if public chooses to come to a hearing, be required to explain the confidentiality provisions to the public before proceeding? I think Judge Bearden, you already mentioned you do. Do you all believe that a court should be required to do that? Best I think practice? you should. I think it best practice to explain to the people instead of just say, get out, um, get out for now. I think that you should explain to them why you're asking them to leave for a period of time um, so that they have an understanding and they know, um, you know, why they're asked to leave for that period and that they can come back or if they can come back and when. Um, so I think that that would be best practice. Okay. Any other comments on that? Well, let me just add how bizarre the statute is that I, I understand if our first time adjudication for delinquencies is, is closed. Um, legitimacy is always open, traffic cases are always open, uh, designated felonies are always open, and, and second or subsequent adjudications are always open. But the statute still has part of the old code that we never changed that said <coughs> delinquencies shall be, a first time adjudication of delinquency has to be open, or second or subsequent or open, except if we discuss dependency or, or deprivation. Mm -hmm. which are now the ones that are open all the time. So the statute bizarrely says, if you're delinquent, but we're going to discuss your, your needs or your dependency, then it's closed. But if, it's, <laughs> if, you're, dependent. if you're dependent but not delinquent, then it's open. So I don't know, maybe a second cleanup bill needs to be passed, but <laughs> it, it is an interesting thought. Does anybody have any more questions? I'm going to keep moving, but let's go <coughs> and take some. Yes, ma'am. And our concern was not that media would come in, and we were not concerned that walk-ins would come in. We were concerned that the judges in our county, at least, were not hearing from some people who might have some data about a child, the children who are victims, not the kids who are, who are perpetrators, but kids who are victims. And so the, the deprivation cases, right? The deprivation right? and okay. the termination, yeah. particularly yeah. cases. Okay. And I, I would really like to know is this working for you at all are you getting any feedback from people like neighbors or other family members or um, school counselors or any people that might help you to make better decisions for the betterment of a child than you could get when nobody was in the courtroom except people who were paid to be there in classes so is the entry of the public affecting any positive outcomes for the children? for the judges and for the children yes, yes. well the private children the, the people that present information or evidence in court are people that will be brought in by the various parties to be witnesses for them. And, uh, but they didn't always bring in people. Well, <laughs> that was the we're not going, that, that's, that's up to the parties. And, right. and we have, you know, the child has an attorney, the parents have attorneys, uh, the state has attorneys. So every party that's in, involved in the proceeding will have an attorney and they can decide what kind of information they want to present on behalf of their case. Um, and if someone is in my courtroom, they raise their hand, I want to say something, I'll say, you need to talk with the attorney. Uh, and, and they'll decide whether or not they, you know, they may find out what you want to say and they'll decide whether they want to present that or not. It's up to the attorneys who represent the parties as to decide how and what they want to present. 
Okay, our, I'm gonna, can I go on a little bit more of that? Our experience with guardian ad litems who were the attorneys for the kids where most of them had never even seen the kids and had not talked to the kids. And so our concern was that, that it'd be nice if somebody was in the courtroom who actually had some data on that child. So, so you, you have not or have you had any experiences where the presence of, of people who've come in on behalf of the child have been helpful to you? And let me just summarize for those online and also because it may help to say, I hope that this is an exception to courts throughout Georgia and I don't believe that it's the normal practice to say, here's an individual who has information about the case, but they can't even come in the courtroom. I think that's what happened, right? Is yeah. that a fair yeah. assessment? So I don't think that's the normal practice, but I'm going to turn to you all to clarify if it is the practice that you used to see. But again, for those online, I think your question is, if that happened, has this law made it any easier for interested individuals in that child's case to come into the courtroom and get that information to the court? Is that a made, fair summary? And has it made it any easier for judges to, to, make, to hear everything? To hear everything. Let, let me address that. Um, mm -hmm. I'm going to say, I'm gonna say sort of. Well, okay. I'm, I'm going to say sort sort of, but not the way you're saying. Okay. Um, I also do not let people come in and say, "Oh, oh, judge, I have something to add." And I don't think that's what you're saying. But there are people who want to add that it's the time to testify, and so they all want to tell me what they want to know. I don't control that. The attorneys call them. We, we have had a guardian ad litem attorney in every case for over a decade. We also have CASAs. Our role of the CASA is a little different than some of the statewide model. We see the CASAs as being fact finders for the attorney guardians. I will also ask every attorney guardian, have you met with this child? And we will, we will pay them extra to go to the home, to go outside the courthouse to do that. All right. So I think it's, it, there are very different standards for CASAs throughout. And uh, 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 I was on one of the early CASA committees when, when all hell broke loose 20 years ago when, when we were trying to decide that we want to be part of it. <coughs> Is that the illegal term for it? I guess it was. Uh, uh, you know, should we start banning guardians from the courthouse? Should we, you know, use CASAs or not? Well, it was a great big hullabaloo many years ago. Uh, so I was right in the middle of that. But, but it, it has not created a situation where people can now just start volunteering. But what it has done is it has created pressure, I believe, on the guardians and maybe on, on the SAGs and the other folks involved to have talked to those folks to present that evidence. And of, even if you're trying to say, let's avoid grandstanding, we're not trying to people just put up testimony because of that, but just if they know the public's watching, I think the tendency is to probably do a little bit more thorough job. So it has accomplished that. And Judge Butler, I'm gonna go to you next. All right, so I, um, in Clayton County, we have a great CASA program. Actually, our CASAs, um, go out and do exactly what you're talking about. They'll talk to the child's school, they talk to people in the neighborhood, they talk to the children's parents, the children's friends' parents, um, and they bring all that back to us. There have been occasions where our CASAs have actually brought in people to the attorney guardian and said, this is someone you should talk to, this is someone the judge needs to hear from. So that does happen, as well as our CASA director is very, very active and she goes further and she goes and talks to mental health providers, she talks to doctors, she's um, in with the foster parents, and she will often bring people in to test, she'll testify and she'll also bring people in to the attorney guardian to put on the stand so that the court can get that information. Now first we get very thorough um, reports from CASA, um, which give us a just a wealth of information but yes they do um, when they feel it's necessary or when it, it'll be meaningful I guess to the proceeding or to the court they do bring people in I, I guess they bring in witnesses though I guess <laughs> I think it might also present just a, another practical problem if someone is in the courtroom and at some point says well I have something to say uh, attorneys most attorneys at the beginning of proceedings will invoke the rule of sequestration, which means all the witnesses have to be outside and only testify one at a time. And someone who's in the courtroom who's sort of been observing and hearing the proceedings who now wants to be a witness uh, sort of flies outside the rule that's been invoked. I'm going to ask you if you have a question to write it down. I want to make one more comment, then we'll take a brief 10-minute break and come back. But would you all agree, I know I've seen lots of different uh, courts throughout the state, and I think it is a rare exception 
that the guardian ad litem, whether it's a lay guardian ad litem or an attorney guardian ad litem, and the children's attorney is not allowed in the courtroom. Would you all agree with that? Normal mm -hmm. practice is that those individuals are in the courtroom for the hearing. Is that a fair statement? Yes. Well, absolutely. I think they have to be. Right. And so I think if that hasn't happened, that's definitely an exception to state what, and that may not be what happened. I don't, it wasn't what happened. So I just wanted to clarify though that everybody should be in the courtroom that has the relevant information theoretically through these means. We're going to take a 10 minute break and come back in. And let's do 2.15. It's a little bit less than 10 minutes, but we can go ahead and get started. I had a couple of follow-up questions. I'm going to start with the panel and we can go from there. I know Judge Bearden, you already stated that you haven't seen, no, Judge Boyd, you said you hadn't seen many motions at all since this law passed. And I'd like to ask each of the others of you first, have you seen many motions um, since January of 2010 to close the courtroom? I Judge have not. Mother? I have not. I think I've had um, one, I had, uh, the attorneys would complain a lot when the law was initially passed. <laughs> Um, no one filed a motion. I think I've done one motion in the five years that I've been around. And okay. I guess it's only been around four, so I've only seen one. Okay. Judge uh, I, By my best count, I've had six. Now, the, the, the cases involving child molestation are, are closed under certain provisions anyway. Um, for, for what that's worth, we try and always agree to have the child testify in chambers. I take off my black dress. We have the key. We, we, introduce the attorneys by their first name, do all that sort of stuff. We used to try and attempt to do that. Um, when the public's invited, though, that's an interesting question. Can you do that? Can you have the child talk in chambers informally? Um, I have not had anybody object to that. I, I think that that's incumbent upon the judge to try and protect the child, so I, I think we can do that. Um, um, I, I've had, uh, I, I've agreed uh, at about half of the six cases that we should uh, close. The case was particularly sensitive, and there, there are specific criteria that you have to go through. And I don't let them just come to court and say, we're about to start, oh, by the way, I want to close it. No, I say this is a written motion. It needs to be filed ahead of time. If we have to have a hearing ahead of time, we need to have done that. This shouldn't be a last-minute deal. Um, but uh, some of the times I also disagree and say, you know, it's a little bit sensitive, but it's not so sensitive that it's going to prevent anyone from testifying. Um, I mean, we... Uh, my great fear was, you know, when we're talking to parents, we, we discuss mental health issues, we talk about drug issues. And I, you know, try and not get in someone's face, but really try and, and empathize with them and say, you know, I, I understand, you know, that. I, I, you know, back when I started doing this, we didn't even have that. We had cocaine. And then we went through crack. And then we went to crack. And now we're to prescription drugs. So we've lived long in that 25 years. But, um, you know, I, I've been there when kids have been shot at when they were in the trunk of a car when mom was visiting the drug dealer. I, I've been there when people were successful and were able to kick that and, and get the kids back and just have wonderful lives and, and, and everything in between. And so when I'm talking to a parent about drug use and they're, you know, they're failing tests and it's obvious drug use or whatever, and I need to talk to them candidly and there's a large crowd there, you know, I'd like to think it hasn't affected it much, but it has a little bit. I, I know it's affected it when we're talking about mental health, you know, especially when you've got paranoid delusions, you've got some things going on. Those folks don't really want to talk about those publicly. So those, I'm, I'm you know, if the guardian or someone is, is more prone to, to ask for closure uh, in, in that situation, I will. In fact, we'll make everybody leave the courtroom. I'll, I'll you know, let one deputy stay in the back if they want to be there. Uh, we'll try and close from all the other clerk personnel, all the onlooking attorneys, everybody, mm -hmm. and really minimize it to three or four people that just have to be there. There has to be a clerk. There has to be the attorneys. There has to be the guardian. Um, and if we can minimize it that way, then maybe we can get to the root of the problem a little bit more. But, um, yeah, probably half a dozen times I've granted half, uh, half of that and denied half of it. Okay, so that's a great example of why you may close it in the best interest of the child. Judge Boyd, Judge um, Butler, do you have any other examples of what would be important factors to you to say it's in the best interest of this child that this hearing be closed? I mean, the age of the child, the maturity of the child, um, whether it will have a negative impact on re reunifying the family. Um, but I think Judge Bearden touched on all of the significant um, valid 
reasons for closing closing a hearing. And we're a small community too. Where kind of everybody knows everybody. Um, Fulton's a little different. Hi. Um, yeah, looking at delinquency cases, I think there are some cases where it'd be appropriate to close because you see you see situations where pretty fights and so on where you get you've you've got camps in the community and while some of the people um, might be there interested in the case, they're not they're interested for other reasons. They may not they not may not have been charged in this particular incident, but they were in the fight last week and might be in the one next week. Um, and if it becomes apparent that um, the folks that are interested in being in the courtroom um, have those kinds of interests, that, that would certainly, I think, justify closing a case okay. or closing the courtroom. All right. Now, in terms of number of motions and the fact that it's really been mentioned <coughs> uh, in all three different types of communities that you all work in, do you have any opinion as to whether or not the number of motions is going to increase now that at least in dependency cases, each child's entitled to an attorney. We've always had attorneys for our child. Um, the children have had attorneys and um, CASA um, guardian ad litems or guardian ad litems. And so we didn't see that change when the law passed. All right. Judge Boyd? Uh, same thing. I mean, we've had child attorneys probably longer than the law has been in, in effect. So I don't really think that's going to be a factor. All right. Yeah, we're, we're the same. Um, we did get a pretty good cross section size and areas, but we're all you've got Team Clayton, who's famous for all their advances, and Fulton, you know, has is, is, is always been on top. Um, and I, I've uh, gotten lucky from time to time, but, but the, the, the counties that are still coming up that, that that were shocked by the new statute saying, You mean we have to have a guardian in every case? <laughs> <laughs> yes, and I just you do. It's none of you, but there are a lot of those out there. And there are some, and it may change with those, but, but for these counties, no. Okay. Do you have any opinions as to whether or not it's going to make a difference in those counties in which it's not true? And a lot of those judges say, we don't have it in the budget, right? That's a really big responsibility to find in the budget. But they do it. They have attorneys in court. Do you think that's going to cause a big increase in the number of these types of motions that are filed? If you have any opinion or thoughts on that. Be sure speculation, but I, it may be, as, as, as Judge Bearden mentioned, in, in smaller communities we're kind of everybody knows each other you're adding one more person who's sort of in the loop um, and that may generate some some interest in, in the smaller communities I think the attorneys have bought into the idea that if if everyone in the four cases before them sees what's going on and, and sees the procedures that you know maybe it's, it's easier to either work out an agreement or uh, you know, to educate the people as to what they need to do. And again, if you have one of those successful cases where the child's going home and the parents are happy and they've done everything and I get to say, out of boy, out of girl, great job, I'm so proud of you, you know, don't need to see me again. Um, that, that's very encouraging to folks. So I, I think the attorneys have bought into that and, and like the open court concept in, in those situations. Will it, I mean, the person who ought to be bringing this though is the guardian. And so for those sure. counties who, who you know don't use guardians or haven't used them in the past will have to start using them in the future. Um, it, it may create more motions. Okay. So let's talk about transparency. If you've watched the news in any capacity, and especially in the last six months, there's a lot of talk about defects needs to be more transparent and give everyone this information. So my question is, do you think that this open courts law at all affects or relates to transparency by the department? Are those two related at all? And Judge Boyd, I'm going to start with you for this one. I think it would, uh, because what is done in a case, what's done on a case, gets laid out in court. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, I mean, that, that in itself creates transparency for what the workings of the department have been. Uh, if it's, um, you know, it, it will if the folks are there to listen, I suppose. Okay. Um, it, it um, Defects has always been responsible for presenting their business and, and their activities in court. Um, and yeah, it relates to transparency, but it, it's still an issue of whether or not folks. There, in that, in that, in that manner, they're, they've been transparent for a while. Okay. 
It's just that there, no, there aren't that many folks that are there to absorb it. And if there were more people who chose to come observe it, do you think that that would help the media and the public perception that there's not enough transparency? Do you think it would give them more information to say, hey, we really have made strides and it is more transparent than it used to be? You know, when you see the kinds of things that sort of get spread out for in some sometimes some significant detail in the media, and they tend to uh, focus on one case that has just really gone totally south, um, and then they'll bring in some other information. But I, I think that if that if folks could see sort of the totality of what happens in cases and what needs to happen and what some of the difficulties are in addressing the issues that come before the court and that, 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 that defects needs to address, um, I think it could create a better understanding of, of where, what can be fixed and where the difficulties are. Um, you know, we, we'll see something hit the media in, in some very egregious kind of case and then the discussion boils up, well, do we need more case workers? Do we need more money? What do we need? Um, and folks start making decisions about what we need to do to fix it. When a team, it, it, it tends to, I think, just grow out of a sort of an immediate sense of frustration rather than a full understanding of what, what all is happening in the process. And if there were folks that, you know, there was mention made of the court, court watch program, which happens in Superior Court. Mm -hmm. If there was that kind of attention paid to someone who would say, I want to see what, not just look stand in this case, but I'm going to watch a week's worth of cases, and I'm going to sort of see how things work generally uh, in these cases, I think that could create a great deal of understanding. Good. Judge Butler, did you have any comments about the transparency aspect? For the department, right? Yes, yes. And, um, you know, the media. The media's demand that there be more transparency or that there should be more transparency. And so the media makes those demands, but still there's not that increased um, media presence in the courtroom. And so in order to have that transparency, they'd have to come. Um, so I think that, it, that it's available, um, but neither the general public nor the media um, are taking advantage of it to the extent you know that they can. Judge Bearden? Yeah, transparency, good. I mean, it's just in, in every situation, it's, it's good. I, I'm thinking about, and what's, what's so tough is, is um, you know, the child fatality report mm -hmm. uh, that came out with all the, the terrible scenarios of kids in care that, that, that died. And I, I was on our local committee for 10 years um, I did my, served my time on it, and it was awful. I'd like to think we were productive, but, but that's a good example. Um, you know, one death is too many, 156, I guess, it's just, just awful. But, you know, is that taken out of context, or it, even if it is, is that being used to try and make the department more responsive? And then I think about the new 1-800 number, if anyone hears from the department, I won't jump in on whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. I will <laughs> simply <agree>. say, <laughs> in a neutral and detached uh, position, uh, good luck with that. And if there are bad cases that result from that, the, the media is going to jump all over that. And even though it may result in some good, you know, uh, a, a better use of resources, if there's anything that's attributed to that, that's what's going to hit the headlines. Um, I talked to Dr. Hill about that. You know, I understand the goals. Uh, I understand streamlining, and I also stand, understand the idea of, of having local resources that are specific to local resources. And, um, you, know, I, I, you know, there will be a fatality. Someone will blame that number. Um, it'll be all in the newspaper, and, and someone's going to have to defend it. I, I know it's coming, and, and I hate it, but it, it's going to come. Is there anything else any of you would recommend or advocate for to increase transparency in an effort to make the child welfare system better, more responsive, more um, proactive in protecting these children? Say the question one more time. If I can remember it. No. Is there anything you recommend in terms of transparency that you think would help make the system better? 
and help protect more children. Because there is a real connection between, oh, if it were transparent and it should be transparent. Are there any things that you as judges would recommend in a theoretical world and say, this could help, this could make a difference? Well, some of that, I think, has already been put in, put in the new code. There are more reviews. Um, there are more specific as to what needs to happen through the course of a case. So new code itself is, is requiring more information to, to be bubbling up to, uh, he, to the hearings. I, I would say it needs to be more transparent to these children that we're talking about. So often you hear children who say, you know, I, I know I was in the system for a long time. I never talked to an attorney. I never talked to a judge. I never talked to a guardian or a CASA. And that's, that's, that, that's horrible. Um, I think the new code absolutely, Judge Boyd is correct, tries to address some of that. But you know, there's not an exact rule that says if they're 12 or over, um, they always have to be in court, or they're, you know, they're, they're different best practices that we use. But I think it needs to be more transparent to the children so they know what's going on. I, I, I know it's a problem to, you know, to be there when mom and dad are talking about mental health issues or abuse or different things, but, but these kids who grow up through the system and don't know what's going on and don't know that we're spending time and effort and, and all this, you know, trying to really navigate this on their behalf, they need to know that. It needs to be transparent for the kids. We, we have a member of empowerment here. I'd be curious to see what oh. he has to say about that. I have two. Yeah, friend is here as well. And let me just state, Empowerment is an, a group that comprised of foster children who have aged out of foster care now advocate for your rights. Is that a fair summary? Oh, I'm sorry. You, were you talking about Brian being, do you think Brian was Empowerment? Did I say, maybe I misstated the organization, <laughs> Judge Boyd. Are you talking about No, I thought, that, I, thought I, I, missed, I thought this was Anthony. Oh. And, and why don't I repeat that though, what I've heard and the many speeches that I've heard them make, and this is in a good way, they have said a lot, you know, when they went through the court system, they were not allowed as the child in the courtroom. And what they said was, and will say publicly is, why can't I hear it? I'm the one who lived it. I know better than anyone else who's going to talk about it in court. So why can't it be me? So do we have something here from empowerment? I don't think, so. no, I don't think we sorry. do. So keeping that quote in mind, I guess it begs the question, do all of you three judges allow children to come into court and be in the courtroom specifically for dependency hearings? Oh, absolutely. Okay, Judge Boyd, Fulton, yes. If Judge they, and if they want to, yes. Sometimes the children don't want to be in and then they're not required to come in. But, but you also have already stated that you have a system in place by where they have a guardian or an attorney who Both. can represent that, correct? Right. That's right. Okay. Judge Bearden? Yeah, I always ask the guardian if the child wants to, to uh, be present, if they want to be heard, do they want to be heard in chambers? Uh, and um, uh, sometimes even younger children you know, definitely want to be there and want to, want to do that. Now, every once in a while, a guardian, and this is the difference between a guardian and a child attorney, right? Is that different roles. A, a, an attorney guardian will say, Judge, I don't think it's in the child's best interest to be there. And an attorney guardian, an attorney for the child might say, you know, I'm going to zealously represent what they want. They want to be there. And then in those cases, I'll appoint two separate attorneys and we'll even <laughs> hash it out and say, how bad is it? And, and is, is it devastating? And I, I have a standing, budget be damned. But I have a standing <laughs> order that, that children who are parties uh, must be in court unless they're excused by their attorney. And tell me why the reason behind, and I'm going to tell you what I'm assuming is that transportation issues, you may not have gotten the department to bring children in care all the time. Is that part of the reason for your standing order to say, yes, they need to be here? Yeah, I mean, they're, I don't care if you got to go to Savannah to get them, you, you, they're entitled to be in court. And so I, the reason for the standing order is to say, don't come into court on the day of the hearing and say, well, it was too difficult to get them here. The only way, we'll continue the case and bring it back when you can have the child here. If there's some reason that they don't need to be there or shouldn't be there, then if you could clear that with their attorney ahead of time, the attorney comes into court and says, no, we'll excuse their presence, we're fine with that. Okay. Good, good practices, yes. It's the exact same practice. We require them to be there. The department does often have to go a very long way away to get the children, uh, but we require them to be there unless they're excused. 
Now I'm going to say Melissa staff the panel because you have three excellent judges who best practices are right here at this table. And so it's great to hear this, but I think we all know there may be some communities, counties that may not, but you've got to hear, I think, best practices. They're coming along. Three different they're, they're perspectives, coming. and you can be the teachers to, to pull them along. Does anyone have any questions in the audience that we haven't addressed that you'd like to ask? No. Okay, good. Go ahead. I'll start with you, and we'll go here next. Okay. Well, this, this question goes to... Um, deals with having children in the courtroom in Fulton County, we are required to have our, our clients are there. Um, have you had a case where a parent has objected to the child being present because they don't want the child to hear, you know, some of the things that are going on? And if so, how did you resolve that if the child was insisting on being present or the child's attorney was insisting on the child being present? So just to summarize, child wants to be present, parent objects, they don't want child present, right? Yes, okay. or, or the SAG, I've had it with the SAG too, where we argue with the SAG about the child being present. Right. So how do, you, how do you guys resolve that? Do you have a hearing or what, what's your thought on that? I haven't had that happen. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think Ms. Patton knows, that in, in my courtroom, uh, there may be times when the attorneys may discuss with each other, look, this is what's, what we're going to talk about. Maybe it's not good for the child to hear all this. And if the child attorney agrees, fine. If, um, if not, you know, just like uh, Judge Bearden said a while ago, that the children need to understand what's going on. And, and it, if you protect them from hearing the reason for the decisions you're making that are in their best interest, I'm not, you know, I'm not sure you're doing them a favor. That, because one of the things I've heard from the empowerment folks that have been through this system is, I want to know. You know, if, if you're making a decision about where I'm going to live or if I'm going to live at home or not, I had to know why. So you would be the decision maker to decide that dispute, correct, and decide either I'm going to say the child's in or not. All right, Judge Bearden, would you approach it the same way? Yeah, I think so. But it's an interesting question because I've never had a parent not want the child in the courtroom either. It, it's, isn't that strange? Um, it, they can be in chains. <laughs> They can be charged with you know, abuse of a sibling or whatever. And, and they, they think that the child being there, hearing them usually is, is gonna help them in some regard uh, or be supportive where they're gonna be able to explain you know, why they did what they did. Um, I, I don't think I've had any parents that say, look, I just don't want my child to listen to that. Um, and isn't that strange that they, they haven't done that? But that's a remarkable question because it's important. I'm going to come here next to Ms. Friend. I'll come back to you. Um, well, as we've all kind of, I guess, alluded to, we do think there are counties out there who are not as enlightened as the three of you. And so if, um, if the public or attorneys for an interested party or whomever is meeting with resistance and noncompliance, what do you think the best remedy is, especially if it's, is, if it's with regard to a particular case? Because what I'm imagining is if I want information on a particular case, it's, it's immediate. It's an immediate need for information. Um, you know, if it's repetitive problems like perhaps what some of these ladies experienced in the past, you know, maybe a little bit different way, but anyway, just some ideas. I'm wondering, is it a JQC complaint? Is it some kind of motion and appeal, which is you know, seems unwieldy and impractical? Uh, I'm curious whether the OCA would accept a complaint. Let me make sure I'm understanding. You're saying that if a court is not complying, in your opinion, with the open court law that we've been discussing, yes. As OCA, I'm going to tell you my opinion is you follow the correct procedure, which is file the appropriate motion that all the judges have mentioned. You cross your T's, dot your I's, see what response you get, have a record made of it, provide the court reporter if you need to, because that doesn't always exist in every county given finances, ask for a copy of that transcript. I don't do appellate work. I'm not certain what you do next, but I think then you have to proceed from there. Hopefully your experts here would have suggestions or thoughts. Well, I think what you're saying is it's going to be moot because the, the, the issue would have gone and passed. So it might help you next time. It's not going to help you on that one. Um, and can I say the JQC just sends cold shivers down my spine? You know? <laughs> uh, I, I wish them well, but I'm never going to say something. You can say, well, Judge Bearden said I should just file JQC. So, so I did. Um, I'd like to hear it. Um, um, 
You know, I, I think it, it's just like those judges who are who are not um, opening the courtrooms, who who were the subject of that JCC uh, JQC complaint. I think maybe they need to be reminded. Maybe a motion needs to be filed. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and maybe they need to be educated a little bit. When I first joined CJCJ, the Council of Juvenile Court Judges, 25 years ago, I thought, well, everyone's going to have the same agreement on this, and everyone's going to have the same level of understanding. And and it was shocking to me that you know uh, half the judges felt one way, half the judges felt another way. It usually came from their background in history. But there's very different opinions on this. Uh, and so uh, I think you need to educate the judge. I think you need to file the motion, cite the chapter and verse. I wish I'd included motions in my packet. I just included my orders, which has that, and, and all those orders are available on sidebar. And I'm on the, uh, that, that's the way the judges chat back and forth confidentially. Um, I've got but, motions uh, if you need them. OCA can give mo four motions if you need them, Judge. And, and, and we're trying to do the new uniform rules under the new code, which, which hopefully form orders like this will include that, and word will get out that this is what you're supposed to do, I hope. Um, but, uh, um, yeah, I, I make my record. Let me ask you this. Do you think, judges, that CJ, CJ may be a route to go and, and not to complain, not to file a complaint, but to instead say, this is my understanding of the law and I'm just having an experience with a specific juvenile court. Is there anything you all could do to help educate the judges? I don't know if that's appropriate or not. I'm not saying it is. I'm asking the question. Well, let me say that Judge Butler's presentation that I've seen, mm -hmm. that she had worked on, would be an excellent presentation for the Council of Juvenile Court Judges. I, I think it's ready to go. I think we need to get her on the agenda, and uh, we need to let her do a presentation on it. Because that would help, I think, right? Yeah. Educate, raise the bar in terms of the education piece. You can't force compliance, but... All right, next, Ms. Friend, I think you had a question. I was thinking about the different circumstances under which children you know, are present in the court and the emotional toll sometimes that, depending on what kind of proceeding it is, it has on them. Um, I've had um, kids come to court and they want to be there and they ask to be there. And then when they start, they, they get upset about two things. When they, when they get upset generally when they hear defects arguing against their parents mm -hmm. or you know making the case against their parents. They become upset by that. They think that the state and everybody is beating up on their parents. Um, I've had instances where kids come to case and um, a lot of these are the kids who come in from unruly, where the parents say, I don't want him. You know, they're, so we kind of have to balance this. And I use, I use CASA to do this a lot of times when we talk about um, whether the kids should come to court. And, and Judge Boyd is right, he has a standing order now. And so the kids are there unless they are excused. Mm -hmm. And so I rely on CASA to help me or help the kids you know, make that determination so they could balance. And, and CASA often talks to their therapist to determine, you know, if it's in the best interest for the children to be there. Another instance that I think, you know, the kids don't need to be there all the time is like uh, TPR reviews. When they hear over and over again, they're not adopted, they're not adopted, they're not adopted. So I think you kind of have to look at the particular hearing that's involved. You have to look at the, the kind of testimony, you know, that's going to be there. And I think that you have to use your CASA, you know, to kind of help you balance and make that decision as to what is in the best interest. But for the most part, I do think it is important for the kids to be there because they need to understand that defects didn't take you away for no reason. You know, a lot of times they want to view defects as the enemy, and it's important, you know, for them to get a, like you say, a full picture, mm -hmm. you know, of what's going on. I think that helps them to adjust. Um, that helps them deal with the reality of whether they're going to go home sooner, you know, or later. So it gives them a picture of reality and what's really exactly. going on. I had a case not too long ago as a SAG, and it's interesting you say that because the mother was in jail, and the mother had convinced her children she had no drug issues or problems. The children were very hostile towards defects because defects had to come out. Yes, your mother has uses meth too often, and she has this drug problem. And the judge knew it because the mother was also in drug court, and the mother, the children didn't know that. And you could see these kids, they were all crying to see their mom, and there she testifies, and the judge starts asking her questions about drug court, and you had a violation, didn't you? Yes. And you used again, didn't you? Yes. And you just saw the kids 
It's like all their air came out because they realized from somebody else, specifically the judge, wow, this is really happening and my mom did do that. And I think that does make a difference. I think that's a good point. Judge, any other questions? Yes, ma'am. There was a case um, a while, well, excuse, this was right after the, the law passed the very first law, and there was a parent attorney who called me who said that she had a parent who had, it was a neglect case, but it, I think the mother was depressed or maybe it was drugs, I'm not really sure, but the, it was a small community and the principal, she was a teacher's aide, the principal had found out about it and come to court to watch the entire hearing. She had made a motion to close the court, uh, but didn't give too many specifics because I guess she was trying to protect her client who didn't want all the stuff that, for reasons why to close the court, but the, the client recognized her boss in the court in the courtroom. And uh, anyway, the judge said, the legislature has determined that the court should be open. This is just, a, just to be like Superior Court, and so we're going forward. Um, and so the woman was gonna probably lose her job at the end of this, and we were probably, we as a system, were gonna probably make things much worse than before, which could have been possibly helping a very depressed person get back on their feet without alerting the entire community to whatever she she had done. And I just wanted to know if you'd heard from other judges. That's that was this the only call I've ever gotten, and I'm really not on the hotline for those kind of calls. But I just wanted to know if there was anybody else who had had a very negative experience, and or if there's any judges who had talked about that specifically, bosses coming, other things that would make the make the situation worse for the family who's already fragile when they're coming to juvenile court. Well, now, was the situation bad because he knew already or because he was going to know the specifics? Like, would it have made a difference for him to hear the specific matter? Because he came to court, so he already knew she was there and he had to have some idea of what that was about. Was she going to be fired anyway? You know, those are good questions. And, I mean, she is probably, she's in a situation where she's got other children, other people's children, that she's the teacher's aide for. So maybe that's, maybe it's all valid, all that comes out. <coughs> I just gave me pause when I got the phone call. Well, as I mentioned earlier, I think the one uh, situation that I've seen, I mean, it's not one case, but one kind of situation I've seen is where there's just a great deal of antagonism between, within a family. And usually it's mom who said this, my daughter never, I mean, grandmother who said this, my daughter's never mounted anything and um, will get up and, and, and won't believe anything that goes on. She's really there just to sort of build her arsenal as to what she can throw at a mother who needs some help. And I've seen that happen. Um, and uh, I, th I think an open, an open court there could, could be harmful to what needs to be done to help the mother uh, get herself back into a situation where she can care for her, her kids. She was, you know, mother in the situation, she had a child very young, she had to live with her mom, her mom kind of took over, and now mom, now mother of the child is, is getting into a position where she's older, she's got some ability, she's got some skills, and she needs some assistance in getting out, but her mom was just pounding her now. Did you close the court for that one? Uh, we did. Um, the one that I remember, I've, I just asked, uh, we, <laughs> You know, we didn't really have a hearing. I mean, I just said, Mom, you're not helping. Um, we need, would you mind stepping out? And um, no one wanted her there as a witness, so she did. And that would be in the interest of justice, but in the case that you're talking about, I think that whether he came in or not, under, depending on when that happened, 1511-84 or 1511-7, I think 10 now, um, even, even if the principal didn't come in, um, under the record um, sharing provisions of SB 207, he could just go and look at all of that information anyway. So his being there, I don't think would have been the determining factor if her concern was, I'm going to lose my job. I don't think that that was it. Um, and embarrassment is not a big enough compelling factor, I think, to have the hearing closed. Okay. Uh, let me add, first of all, I think it's interesting that J4C has it hasn't heard more complaints about that. Probably I just, a good thing, yeah. I just, maybe it is a good thing, or just that this is under the radar, that people just are not talking about open courts. They're just not being known, so that, that, that's very interesting. Um, she probably could have filed a complaint. <laughs> <laughs> she may, still, we'll see. Um, again, the, the way the system evolved, it was to protect the parents who were being rehabilitated from hurting their reputation. Um, 
I think, primarily, and, and the children incidentally. Mm -hmm. And so you know, opening it all up is going to show mm -hmm. some people that there's some parents who've done pretty bad things. And hopefully, maybe, that they will recover from that. But sometimes people are less forgiving. So it doesn't surprise me. It probably has happened more times. I, I know I've had some landlords who came to testify, and then you know, we, excuse, we, we excuse them after they've testified. But we say, now it's open court, so you're welcome to remain present if you'd like. And sometimes they do, you know, and, and that's not always good for the family. Right. Because before I could just say, well, you know, the rules of vote, now it's a private proceeding, you can leave. You can't do that anymore. Now they're welcome to have a seat after their, the rule of sequestration no longer applies. So. And Ashley, question. could you talk a little bit about the peer review system? I mean, the peer yes. review uh, project you're, you're, you're trying to get started. In open courts has been so helpful. I mean, we, you still make a courtesy phone call. So right, but right. It still is, the presumption is it's no big deal to come in and watch court. Right, that's what we were just talking about. So the peer review project is done right now through the Justice um, Committee on Justice for Children through the Supreme Court. And the goal is for attorneys to go to court in juvenile courts and observe and watch the guardian ad litem's attorney for the children and how they are performing. And there are different reasons for this, but it is to see, first of all, you know, there's now the pre-training requirement for guardian. I say now, it's not immediate. It was previously. But the guardian ad litem's in court are supposed to have pre-training. Is that happening? Have they been trained? Are they, Carla Friend, you, you summarized all the things that you think about and you put into it to decide if your client or the child should be in court or not. Are they doing that? Or do we go to courts where we see that's the common practice? Or do we go to another opposite extreme where perhaps the person who has all the information about the child's not in court and the child's not in court and you have a, an attorney sitting there or a body sitting there not saying anything? And the goal is to give feedback. And I think that what we found is it is a courtesy. We call the court and say we're going to come in and observe and we'd like to do this and we have an instrument we use. And most courts say, absolutely, please do give us feedback. You know, let us know what you see or what thoughts you may have. There are some courts that are resistant to that. Now, I was just explaining with open courts, we can all go. We don't have to get permission. I can go through OCA because it, legislatively I have that ability. So, you know, what do you do with that? I think you try to educate those judges on politely, nicely, so I don't get kicked out and never allowed back in a courthouse. But, you know, it is an open court, so we can come and watch. But we'd like to work with you and get permission and let you know what we're doing and do it that way. So generally, that collaborative effort, I think, is super successful. There's a rare exception. That's always going to be the case, I think. Does that summarize it, Michelle, enough for kind of what you're thinking? You need to review the SAGs, too. All right, now. <laughs> so listen, let me comment on that, because I'm going to comment now as OCA and not as a SAG. But I'm going to tell you this, as OCA, I do know that we do receive information, and there are questions on referrals received by the OCA <coughs> about specifically the department, the attorney for the department. We have one case where there's a question asked, did the department have an attorney who represented what the department wanted or was the attorney representing something different in a settlement conference and it's created a problem with custody of the child that now this person's complaining about, right? But I'm going to say this. Um, in the last year, and I'm, I'm going to put you on the spot, in the last year before I took this appointment, I saw more SAGs reprimanded and replaced than I'd seen in 15 years. So I do think that the Attorney General's Office responsible for SAGs is paying attention and is aware and is getting complaints and handling those in a different way than they used to. Now, Brian, you may have a different perspective, and I hate to put you on the spot, but I did, um, or comments on that. I guess I will say your comment sounds encouraging, and I hope that it is true. Um, I've got 15 years in the department and at all levels of feedback and all the work as a SAG, and I guess from my experience from both perspectives is that that's a real slow process. Okay. And, and, and has been pretty unresponsive. So that's an important, there's the opposite side. So I don't know how to best answer that, but I think there'd probably be an agreement it's needed. But that's the other side of the open court argument, you know, mm -hmm. is that it is open to the public. And they come in there and they see you acting in what should be your official and your professional capacity. You know, that is the impression that they get of what is going on in the courtroom, how the, the case managers conduct themselves mm -hmm. on the stand how the individual attorneys conduct themselves in a professional, zealous, but courteous manner. And a lot of times when people were to come into court sometimes, I mean, they were like, what is going on? <laughs> you know, we lose that. We Sometimes we get so caught up in trying to get our point across. 
you know, that we forget that people are looking at us. And is this the kind, what kind of image do I want the public to see of me as a child attorney or as an attorney for the department? You know, we're losing sight of that. I'm glad that, that all the parties are getting more zealous in their representation. I appreciate that. But I think in, in, in the quest for zealousness, you know, we're losing, losing some of our professionalism. And I would say as OCA, those are complaints or referrals or issues that I, I'm looking at systemic issues as well as the individual cases referred, and I could go on and on and I won't, but bring those to my attention, and I appreciate you saying that. I'm going to say not too long ago, within the last month, I've been in court observing, and as I said, I, I, integrity and professionalism I believe in, no matter who you're representing, like you just said. I wanted to crawl under the bench because of the attitude of the SAG. I was embarrassed. It was awful from the get-go with everybody, not just one party. So I recognize it can happen with any attorneys. Bring this to my attention, associate. All right, anything else? Yes, ma'am. I'm curious, you were describing some of the efforts that of the peer review. Um, I don't work on the uh, dependency side, but I'm interested in delinquency proceedings and was curious if there are any parallel undertakings um, on the delinquency side. Um, so the question was, are there any parallel undertakings on the delinquency side similar to the peer review project? I'm not aware of any. Michelle, are you or Melissa? I think that would be a great idea. I don't think there is any. There's a special grant just for this particular peer review. However, uh, Judge Bearden is on the, what do you call that committee you're, that you go to? About Which half one? a dozen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's, there's the, the Juvenile Justice, Justice Implementation, Justice Implementation <laughs> Subcommittee. But, but we stole the idea for the peer review from, there's a drug court committee as well. Uh, I don't know if any of you serve on the drug court committee, but they are, they are kicking off a peer review of each other. So one drug court will pair up with another drug court and they'll switch off and watch each other. And they're gonna try to evaluate each other's teams and the way each other uh, behave. And that's a very good way, I think, to start a quality assurance program. Peers reviewing peers instead of hiring experts to come down and review. And I think it might be more influential if peers from a neighboring county who've been doing it for 10 years go and sit and watch it. We'll see, this is all experimental. Mm -hmm. But we're copying another program, so if these two programs are successful, you could replicate it to other things as well. I would just add that the real resources on the delinquency side come from the National Juvenile Defender Center and the Southern Juvenile Defender Center, which you're probably familiar with. They don't do it on a routine basis and not every local jurisdiction, but periodically come through and do regional comparisons across states um, with a select number of court through observations and other things. So there's that. Um, it's not uh, at the level of rigor, perhaps, that this peer review design allows, but there is that resource. Now I'm going to turn it back to the panel. Did you all have any closing comments or other thoughts you'd like to share as we wrap up? We're a few minutes early, but Melissa, unless there's so, something I haven't addressed, I think we've we're... exhausted the topic and everyone's fully satisfied. There's no reason to belabor it. Okay, but I want to turn it over to each of you, and I'm going to start Judge Butler with you, my far left, and move this direction. I just want to say thank you for having me. Um, it's been great, and I've gotten some great ideas from uh, my fellow judges, some things I can take back to um, Clayton County that we're not doing. And um, I know you all have a tiny copy of my PowerPoint, but I do have it that I can email if you all would like a larger um, copy of that. Judge Boyd? Um, well, I, I guess I would echo what uh, Judge Butler said. Uh, I uh, always seem to benefit by sitting around hearing what other judges have to say and hearing how that sounds to folks that aren't judges. Um, that's helpful. Um, I hope you've learned something, but I've learned something too. Thank you. Um, just a couple of things. One, we have a great SAG, and we have really good caseworkers. And I, I, maybe I'm blessed, but uh, I, I, I have, uh, you know, if I ever have a caseworker who's, who's shirked on something, you know, generally will We'll discuss it in chambers uh, with the SAG president. Uh, if that doesn't happen, uh, you know, I think the third thing down the line is to, to publicly berate them. But uh, <laughs> I, I have been, I do get to sit in other counties where it just looks like there's open warfare and it's shocking to me. But, uh, and usually when my attorneys go travel to different places and come back, they say, oh, Judge Bearden, oh, you wouldn't believe it was like this. Well, we need to improve that. We need, we need to, you know, and so, but we, we do have an excellent SAG, we have excellent defects case workers in, in, uh, in Gordon County. So, you know, they, they're the ones pushing for a lot of this transparency. 
Um, secondly, there was something that was mentioned a little while ago, which worries me a little bit about transparency, which is settlement conferences. Now, I'm not somebody that says, y'all work everything out and then bring it to me after it's all done and I'll say grace over it. I understand the need for that. I, I understand that the time is short and there's some good things in settlement conferences. But, but there are some judges who, who view their judge, judging role as, as largely administrative, and they're not really judicial in capacity. You know, hence, doing the open calendar call, discussing the settlement discussion publicly, um, having the children there and talking about what the settlement is going to be if there's a, an offer that the court can or cannot accept. Um, so I do think open courts have an important role. And as we get to a purely administrative role for the courts, I think it becomes less public and less transparent. I worry about that. Um, so that's a concern. And then um, um, finally, I, I'm, I'm glad to hear that there's some concern about this. I know uh, I'm told that there was a bright young law student who's now first year at Emory who once did a survey. <laughs> Happens to be my son. Um, <laughs> I'm a very good supervisor. Who's not here watching his dad because he's supposed to be studying for his criminal law final tomorrow, which I'm sure he is. But he did a, a survey month. He, he did work before he was in law school. Worked one summer for, for Barton and, and uh, you know, found out that there, there was a lot of, of courts that had not changed at all with the new open court provisions. Just like it did not filter down. They hadn't heard about it. They didn't know about it. And they hadn't changed things. So, you know, the more we can do about this, the more they know about it, the more they better change. But what if they, what if they don't? I mean, what's the, as the public, and I feel like it's our responsibility, all these children in foster care, they're our responsibility, they're the state's. So as a private citizen, what can we do if the courts don't? Well, it would be hard for me to believe that when faced with a guardian who files a motion, I, I heard some discussion about filing a motion to open the court. There's no open to motion to the court. The courts are open. Right. They, you, don't, you don't ask to come in. You come in, period. Now, maybe that's not realistic, okay? Maybe there's guards at the door who keep you from doing that. that. That's not the way it's supposed to happen, okay? It's only supposed to be closed after these motions. So, so let's say that's not happening. Um, the media. God forbid, JQC, uh, <laughs> filing a motion, um, getting the attention of guardians, uh, and getting an advocate, uh, a guardian who's a, a strong advocate, and um, you know, getting some attention to do that. I, I think there are remedies for that. And, and you know, the laws sometimes trickle down for a while. This has trickled down for a pretty good length of time. It's been four years. We should have been doing this by now. But it, it's coming. I think one of the reasons Judge Bearden has such good case managers is we train them in Fulton County and then <laughs> they decide they'd like to go live in the mountains. That's it. That's it. And they go to Gordon County. <coughs> Melissa, I'm going to Oh, yes, Michelle. Yeah, I was just thinking about something that Carla had brought up, and I just wanted to, I don't know, I can't remember the site, but it's been a while since I read it, but I read a study a while back that said that the reason that people don't want to go to the state is because they're afraid they're going to be sent to the county and they're going to be sent to the county and they're going to be sent to the county and they're going to be sent to the county and they're going to be sent to the county and they're going to be sent to the county and they to find it about when there was a number of uh, victims of violent crime, rape, mur uh, family members of somebody who had been murdered, and they talked about basically 10 years out um, how they felt about justice in general, and those who had actually participated in their cases and watched everything had a much higher opinion of the justice system than those who did not participate. So I think about that as far as like what we're impacting when they reflect back 10 years ago. The other thing I was thinking about when you were speaking was that I saw a foster youth who's adult now um, talk at a conference about a couple years ago, and he talked about basically being a child, and I think he was like 10 when he was in a, the court case, and seeing the police respond and the court respond to say to his father, what you're doing is just wrong, and we're going to punish you to the full extent of the law. It was very satisfying because he was baffled. And he'd grown up with this, he accepted this was normal, he did love his father, but again, it was 20 years later that he had a very high opinion of justice and the system because they had reacted properly in his opinion, but he didn't think so at the time. He was very, very upset that everything was happening to his father. So 
I, I don't, those are, that's just an anecdote, but I just was thinking about that for of the stuff you're experiencing. The, the, the issue is that, is that we have to be aware of the impact. Mm -hmm. And so that if I know that my client's going to be there and hearing something, I want the therapist to be prepared either before or after, you know, to deal with, you know, to deal with that, to minimize to, you know, the extent, not to say, don't be there. You know, like, yeah. But to treat them. If there's trauma as a result, right. a lot of the trauma, complex trauma training would say, treat them through the therapist. Melissa, I'm going to turn it back over to you. I, too, thank you for the opportunity. And judges, I've learned a lot. Well, first, I don't know if you had any last comments. No, I no mind, just so. the thank you. I learned so much and have great respect. And again, it's a little, um, a little stacked because these are great judges and their practices. But I think we all learn from that. So I thank you. Well, picking up on that, too, first and foremost, please help me join and thank you, everyone. All right.